Once again, it would be good for us to start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. After the first talk, I had some afterthoughts that I wanted to uh, share with you. <clears throat> and the first is with regard to a question that came up. What is one to do if a, an adult is not baptized but unconscious? What can or what should be done? And that was a very good question. In sacramental theology, we know we study what we call conditional intentions. And a condition is setting something that we know only God knows. And we gave an example of that when we did the second baptism at Sacred Heart Hospital when we said, Si vivis, if you are living. God knows if the soul is still in that child's body. This was a, a like a 10-year-old girl who had just suffocated. But the point to be is to be made is, is that conditions are sometimes set in baptism. We're, instead of writing in Latin, we're writing in, in English. <clears throat> the conditions are, like we mentioned, if you are living, I baptize you, etc. Or if you are not baptized, I baptize you, etc. Now, what do you do when you're not sure if someone has the belief or the desire for baptism? You can say, if you are capable, I baptize you. God knows if they're capable. And you're putting that condition down so as not to render the sacrament being uh, administered invalidly and irreverently. That's the reason why we put this condition down. You can't baptize someone who's dead. Their soul is not in their body. If someone's already baptized, you're forbidden to baptize them again. But if there's a doubt, then you say that condition if you are not baptized. And God knows that. And in this case, in Latin, it would be C. Capox S for the priest. Now that was what you, that was what you in an emergency baptism should do if you're not sure if someone's been uh, it has the right beliefs or desire for baptism. If you are capable, which God knows, do they want to be baptized? Uh, do they believe sufficiently to be baptized? Those are things. If they're unconscious, you don't know. But once again, you're protecting the sacrament by putting this condition down. If okay, if they don't have it, then it's not your intention to baptize. And a priest does this when he administers the sacraments. If someone's unconscious and the priest, they're, they're, they're dying or they're in very serious danger, the priest will say in his mind, see kapak and then give them absolution. Because in order for your sins to be forgiven, you have to be sorry for your sins. But if somebody's unconscious, you don't know whether they're sorry or not sorry. But God knows that. So that your absolution, the forgiving of sins, the sacrament of penance, will not be done irreverently, administered to someone who's not worthy. The priest makes that mental intention, see Kapak says, if you are capable. And then he gives the absolution. And the same thing would be for the sacrament of extreme unction. If someone's unconscious, the priest could give them sacrament of extreme unction, see Kapak says. He doesn't have to express it verbally but just mentally. Whereas in the ritual, though it says, si vivis, si non es baptizatus, or baptizata for a, a girl or a woman, if you are not baptized, ego te baptizo. So you can set that, that condition down. And I would also say too, I just like to recommend this. If you have a friend or relative, someone who's sick, and you think they should probably you're not proud, but they need to see a priest. I wouldn't wait till they're at the last extremity 
to call a priest. First and foremost, it would be important to be honest with them and say, you know, you're not doing very good. And if things don't work out very well, it would be good if you were to prepare yourself to meet God. And if you don't mind, I'd like to recommend, I know of a priest that'd be happy to see you and talk to you. And you don't have to panic. Hopefully you'll pull through. But maybe if you don't pull through, it'd be good to see a priest. And I remember an example of uh, Father Clement Kubish. He was from Clarks, Nebraska. And during the Vatican II and Novus Ordo era, he uh, did not compromise. He kept offering the Latin Mass. And Archbishop Sheehan from Omaha said, either go along with the new Mass in Vatican II or you're out. So he was uh, ex- you know, taken out of his parish and taken out of the diocese. But Father Clement Kubish, he gave a sermon one time and he said, I believe it was a man who was dying and his wife wanted him to see this his wife wanted this priest to see her husband. And so when he came in, the man said, what are you doing here? The priest said, uh, your wife wanted me to see you. He said, uh, go away, I don't need to see you. So he just took, he just sat down and took out his watch and just sat there. And the man looked over and said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm looking at Father Clement Kubish. He said, I'm looking at my watch. He said, the doctor said, you only have a couple hours to live. I'm going to see how close they're going to be. And he said that not to be sarcastic, but to say, you're right about to leave this world. You should do all that you can now to get prepared. He didn't do it sarcastically, but he said that with the sincerity of, I didn't come here for nothing. I want you to come back to God. And that man got reconciled with with the church and received the last rites. So it's very important, the art of knowing what to say, when to say it, how to say it, you really need to be prudent. You need to call on the Holy Ghost for guidance. But how important it is that if we know of people that are in danger of death or need the sacraments, let's not wait till they're unconscious, but let's do all that we can while they're still conscious and can know what they're doing. How often it's happened with our priests, I this amazing thing to be at the right place at the right time. I was speaking about this in a sermon, but I knew this was God's will because I had a very busy summer a couple summers ago. No time to do anything, just on the road, traveling, paying bills, cutting through the mail, answering letters, answering phone messages, and just nonstop. I had a little window of opportunity and uh, this gentleman, he said he and his sons were going to go fishing. He said, I wanted to go f- ask if I wanted to go fishing. And I said, that was not a, a, a question you asked the bishop. Does he want to go fishing? Of course I'll go fishing. And no sooner had I wrapped everything up, I was, I was out of state at the time, wrapped everything up at the church. I just got changed, and I was thinking about, okay, what kind of bait and what I'm going to use for the technique for fishing. My cell phone rang. I know somebody from out of state. And they said that they had a relative who was dying. And they want, they were asking me. They thought I was in Omaha still, but they said they want to know if, if there's a priest in the area. And I said, priest in the area? I'm about two or three hours away. So that's exactly what we did. And I knew that was God's will because I was looking forward to the fishing trip. But it was only to be a couple hours of fishing. And like I mentioned in the sermon, uh, this poor guy was in really, really bad shape and uh, gave him the last rites. And, you know, on the way home, I was thinking I caught a bigger fish than I could ever have expected. This soul came back to God. And those are consolations that, you know, there's no thing in the world, no happiness or no amusement or no, you know, entertainment. It's all worldly. That's, that's nothing is the satisfaction that God gives you in your soul to realize, you know, as much as you make mistakes as many faults and failings as you have, you know, God used you at that moment as an instrument to bring this person back. And so it's, uh, I'm sure all of our priests have stories like that, but I just wanted to say it's a remarkable thing to be at the right place at the right time. You just think somewhere that person made his nine first Fridays, somewhere someone was praying for him, maybe some of his relatives. He did something and right, but in his life, but somehow God gave him that grace, that mercy 
to have a true priest be there before he died. So with regard to adults, we were saying they have to have the desire for baptism. They have to want to be baptized. You can't just baptize anybody and everybody. Number two, they have to believe in danger of death in an emergency baptism when death is imminent. Belief in God, He exists, He rewards and punishes in the next life. That's Hebrews 11.6. Uh, that they believe in the Blessed Trinity, they believe in incarnation, and implicitly believe all that God has revealed. And then be sorry for their sins and you can baptize them. I was also going to say too, with regard to Scripture, there's one interesting thing that might be practical for all of you and that is called the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek version of the Old Testament. This was translated from Hebrew into Greek for the benefit of a pagan king so that he would have Scripture available. And the Septuagint got its name because of the 70 scholars who helped translate the books, the Hebrew books of the Bible into the Greek. What is unique about the Septuagint is that there is a difference between the old Hebrew translation of the Bible and the Septuagint that was translated about 300 B.C. The difference is that the Septuagint has quote-unquote extra books. What you need to remember about the Septuagint is this. The apostles used the Septuagint. Of the 350 Old Testament quotes in the New Testament, meaning the New Testament when it quotes in the Gospels, it quotes back to the Old Testament, of the 350, 300 are taken from the Septuagint. Most of them are taken from the Septuagint. The early church used the Septuagint, this Greek version. But even before the apostles, before the coming of Christ, this Septuagint version was accepted by the Jews, by the Israelites. It was used in their synagogues the oldest Bibles that exist today, the oldest recorded Bibles that exist, there are four. There's the called the Codex Vaticanus, and it gets its name because it's in the Vatican Library. There's the Codex Ephraim, Ephraimi, and that is because this Codex originally before there were Bibles or books with pages, they were on scrolls. Some scrolls were made of parchment that would dis, dis, uh, disintegrate quite rapidly, so they were put on leather skins. And it was possible for, if you use their leather skin for one writing, leather was pretty durable. And if you wanted to erase, because you had plenty of copies of one thing, you can rewrite over another. And I think it was this something that St. Ephraim had written and they noticed underneath it a text that was written when they erased St. Ephraim's text they found the Old Testament but what's interesting is these copies of the Old Testament one is Codex Sinaiticus found on Mount Sinai and the other one was Codex Alexandrinus as it was found in the monastery of uh, St. Catherine of Alexandria, I believe. But the point to be made, these four oldest books in the London Museum, the Vatican, etc., these four oldest codexes, they all have the quote-unquote extra books. Now, the reason why we mention this is because of the fact that when Luther broke with the church in 1517, Luther obviously had points of denying Catholic faith and what the Catholic Church, the Church of Christ had founded, he obviously denied very clearly things that have been held since the very beginning. Somehow, though, he needed to try to do all that he could to justify his denial of these doctrines. 
And so what he did is in the second book of Maccabees, he found the idea of offering up sacrifice for the dead that we can atone for their sins. It is a holy and wholesome thought, holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they may be loosed from their sins. He didn't like that. And so what Luther did is he denied the Septuagint and went straight to the Hebrew Bible to translate. And then thus he was able to get rid of these quote-unquote extra books. And that's how he justified it. And besides getting rid of the Epistle of St. James... But if, if the Protestants try to accost you and say, oh, you, you Catholics, some Pope added those books in there. You know, you don't know that, but they did. Because our, our Bible doesn't have those extra books. The interesting thing is, is that these quote-unquote extra books were found, are found in the Septuagint. And how do we explain that? But that, okay, you have the ancient Hebrew Bible when the Septuagint had been written and translated into Greek this was done around 300 B.C., but God was still revealing things in the Old Testament. And thus it is that there's these quote-unquote extra books that were accepted by the Israelites, that were used by the apostles, and that most of the New Testament quotes of the Old Testament, most of them come from the Septuagint, and the early church used the Septuagint. And Codex Vaticanus, Codum Ephraim, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Alexandrinus. Like I say, these are pr primarily named from their place. Vaticanus, this codex is in the Vatican Library. And like I say, Sinaiticus, Mount Sinai, and Alexandrinus. I'm a little, I, I have to refresh my memory on that. Um, I do have senior moments at times. And um, I think it was found, this was found in a monastery. But be that as it may, these are the four oldest Bibles in existence. These four oldest Bibles have, quote-unquote, the extra books. And all the Bibles that have been translated, in, uh, or not translated, but written and copied by hand by monks down through the centuries, all had these, quote-unquote, extra books. Not until Luther came along and threw these things out. So, oh, we're going to go back to the Hebrew Bible. We're not going to accept the Septuagint. And not only that, but when, when Luther translated his version of the Bible, obviously there were, there were explicit departures from the original text to justify his position about faith alone. And we don't have to keep the commandments, just believe. And we're all sinners. And all the other things that Luther had an issue with. So, just a little something to consider uh, in, the, in the area of the Bible. Also, with regard to the translations of the Bible, I think it's important that all of you remember that you should only be using a Catholic Bible. You shouldn't be using Protestant Bibles that have mistranslations, severe mistranslations. Catholic Bibles today, the Douay Reims, and also the confraternity. Now I'm going to give you a look. I just there's, you go through a hundred, hundreds of examples, but you come across the modern American Bible of the Protestants or a modern so-called Catholic version. Just one example of how things can be perverted or changed. The answer of our, of our Blessed Mother to the angel. We read of, in the Catholic Bible, our Blessed Mother, when she was told that she was to be the Mother of God, she says, How shall this happen since I know not man? What's interesting about this is this word shall. You can find a version that would say, How can this happen? since I know not man. A big difference between shall and can. Here, it sounds like Mary's questioning God. How, how, can, how, can, how can this happen? How can this happen? She's questioning God, His power, His ability, and our Blessed Mother would never do that. 
Whereas here, she's merely wanting to know the will of God. How shall this happen? I know, I know it's all things are possible to God. What am I to do? How, how can I cooperate in this? Here's another point about Scripture. Since I know not man. She was a spouse to Joseph, and yet she says, I know not man, signifying her vow of virginity. Very interesting. But the point to be made, and we want to get off the topic, is the idea of can. How interestingly one word can really uh, destroy the sense or throw things off. We also have the, the issue, too, in Protestant Bibles is that they'll have, obviously, footnotes or commentaries by Protestants trying to justify their position, their denial of things that are clearly found in the Bible. So, very important, have a good Catholic Bibles on hand. I wouldn't be using anything other than a Catholic Bible. Okay, what else do we want to cover here today? Another topic that I uh, wanted to cover with you, we'll just kind of go through these randomly, and that is the uh, the topic of jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is authority. And you need jurisdiction to hear confessions. You need jurisdiction to witness marriages, matrimony. And the question comes up for traditional priests, traditional clergy, where is their jurisdiction? Maybe some have asked that. And, you know, in this day and age, there's a lot of different traditional Catholics out there who have rejected Vatican II, and there are some who stay home. We call them home aloners because they don't think there's anybody out there that's good. So they completely stay away. They think, well, you don't have jurisdiction, you don't have jurisdiction, and canon law says this and canon law says that, so you're all no good. There's nobody good. I'm just going to stay home. Baptize my kids, make an act of contrition, and hope that everything works out. But what type of jurisdiction? There's, there's three types of jurisdiction. There's ordinary. There's delegated. And then there is supplied. Ordinary jurisdiction comes from holding an office, a position. Delegated is, is that it's given. So I, by somebody who has ordinary jurisdiction, jurisdiction they're, they're delegating, they're giving their jurisdiction to someone else. So like if someone is visiting another diocese and they want to have a wedding, maybe a relative, they would have jurisdiction delegated to them to operate in that diocese. They don't have an office in that diocese. They're not the bishop. They're not the pastor of the parish. But it's delegated to them. But this is the issue that I think a lot of people don't understand. What is supply jurisdiction? Supply jurisdiction is given by the church at the moment of the administration. Meaning, the person doesn't have jurisdiction before or after. But at the moment... He is operating, he's administering a sacrament, he has jurisdiction supplied to him by the church herself. What does the church teach about this? First and foremost is there is a very common expression in sacramental theology, the sacraments are for men. In danger of death, any validly ordained priest can minister the sacrament can absolve you from your sins. Any any valley ordained priest, be he fallen away priest who left the priesthood and is married, uh, be he a schismatic priest who is separated from the church, meaning like a Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox priest, as long as they have valid orders, in danger of death, any priest can absolve you from your sins. Now, why does the church do that? Not to give the excommunicated or the schismatic priest recognition by no means, but for your spiritual benefit. So in danger of death, the church supplies jurisdiction. 
Now, in this area of supply jurisdiction, there's also, outside of the danger of death, another consideration. Those who have the office, such as the bishop of a diocese, diocesan bishop, or a pastor of a parish, they have an obligation in justice to administer the sacraments. That is their office. They are there and they must administer the sacraments. But there's also what we call the obligation in charity. And this is where I think a lot of those who are home aloneers have never even ventured into that branch of moral theology what the church teaches. St. Alphonsus Liguori and the best of theologians, moral theologians like Pope Leo XIII says, St. Alphonsus Liguori, he can, his moral theology can be followed without fear of error. Now what happens if, in a given situation, a priest is visiting, a visiting priest comes to a parish, it's a holy day of obligation, and the pastor is sick in the hospital. He's unconscious. Or he was supposed to be there and he's not there. Large concourse of people there. It's a holy day of obligation. People want to go to confession. These are examples of what St. Alphonsus Liguori and moral theologians would say. The church would then supply that jurisdiction. He doesn't have ordinary jurisdiction. He's just a visiting priest. He doesn't have an office in that diocese. No one's given him the authority to hear confessions. But nevertheless, this is supplied by the church for the benefit of the faithful. And it's supplied by the church. Now, under what context does this even come into the picture? St. Alphonsus Liguori and other moral theologians are talking about the kind of sin it would be, the kind of sin it would be for a priest to enter the confessional without ordinary jurisdiction, without delegated jurisdiction. If he enters the confessional without either of these, he's basically forcing the church to supply the jurisdiction. You as lay people do not have to worry about, where did you get your jurisdiction from? Let me see your faculties. Read this to me in Latin. What does it say? You don't have to worry about any of that. When you go to confession to the priest, you don't have to worry about that. And we're talking about even in normal times, not extraordinary times like we are today, but in normal times, it wasn't for the lay people to question that priest whether he had jurisdiction or not. He goes in a confessional, your sins are forgiven, period. What kind of sin would he commit were he to do this? Let's say some visiting priest, he's from one diocese, he goes to another diocese, there's no need for him to go into the confessional and hear confessions because the pastor's resident, the assistant pastor's there. It's not a holy day of obligation, but he just decides, so oh, I think it'd be a cool thing to hear confessions here. Sits down, starts hearing confessions. Those penitents who come to him, their sins are forgiven, but he would commit a serious sin because he's forcing the church to supply this jurisdiction when there's not a need. On the other hand, when there is a need, theologians say, if there's a need and a benefit of the faithful, holy day of obligation, Sunday, someone is, there's no other priest available who has jurisdiction, the church definitely supplies and it is no sin at all to hear confessions. No sin. The church will supply that jurisdiction. There's also a, a bigger situation, and that is in the, the, the bigger scheme of things, <clears throat> what is the situation in the church today? Well, I've done a lot of research trying to find parallel situations, and <clears throat> I was going through different libraries, uh, went to Boston College, went to St. John's University up north of St. Cloud. I've gone to Creighton University in Omaha. But there, there's a very interesting situation and that is in what's called the Great Western Schism. What do theologians say about this time in the church? Well, quick, quick review of the history. 
uh, the Pope was or, uh, elected, Pope Urban the sixth. He was elected. Now, prior to this, the Pope, the, the a succession of popes were elected and lived up in Avignon. Papal states went all the way up there, up into southern France. So the Pope was not even residing in Rome, but he was up in Avignon. And it was creating problems for the church. In fact, I think it was St. Catherine Siena asked the Pope to come back to Rome. He came back to Rome. He died. And so Urban VI was elected. But after his election, he began to issue reforms <clears throat> which the cardinals did not like. So the cardinal said, we were under duress. And I, I believe reading that at that time of the election of Urban VI, there were Italians out there shouting, elect an Italian or whatever. So these cardinals were saying, no, we're under duress of that crowd outside. And we were not able to vote freely. So the, the majority of the cardinals then said, Urban VI is not the Pope. They went up to Avignon and elected a Pope Clement. What's interesting is, when Urban VI died, he had a successor. Clement died, he had a successor. But in the meantime, Urban VI was making cardinals. And so was Clement making cardinals and their successors. This lasted for, I think, 20-something years. And then there was a third group of people from the the urban succession and the Clement succession went to Pisa where they elected another Pope. I think his name was Pope John. But the point to be made is that the church was divided with three men claiming to be Pope. It wasn't what they call a schism in the right proper sense of the word because a schism is separation from the Pope and it, there was no intention of anybody separating from the Pope. They just didn't know who the true Pope was. Now, it makes for interesting uh, debate, and you can read what different theologians had to say about this whole situation, but the true Pope was definitely Urban and his successors because the cardinals had recognized him and it was only after the fact of his recognition that they started saying, oh, we were under duress, etc. Be that as it may, the question was, what about those who mistakenly followed this pope or this pope? And when we say anti-pope, these men were wanting just to be pope. It was a, lot, a matter of politics. They were, I mean, I should say they were wanting to be Catholic the people who followed them wanted to be Catholic. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, there were saints who found themselves on the wrong side of the of this schism or this 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 breakup here. So there was first of all the use of schism. Yes, there was separation, but it wasn't a schism as we understand it in a proper sense. There was no questioning the Pope; just didn't know who he was. But what about the sacraments administered? Because these men who thought they were Pope were not just making cardinals. They were appointing bishops for dioceses. They were vacant or they thought they were vacant. You know, you had diocese here and this this bishop's under Urban the Sixth, and that one's under Clement and got very confusing. And then these bishops then appointed priests to be pastors. What about the sacraments that were being administered if they were in the wrong camp. And once again, it comes up, it was supplied jurisdiction. Why did the church have this supplied jurisdiction? It's for the common good. The church understands that lay people, they're sheep. They need to be guided. It's, they, it should not be their worry. I mean, that jurisdiction, let me see your factories, read that in Latin. Me. You don't have to worry about that. So the issue was, these were they were all Catholic. It was a matter of politics. There was a, no denying the papacy. It was just a question of who the true Pope was. Now, there was an a eminent theologian, Jesuit theologian. I believe his name was uh, 
Francis Suarez. It was his opinion <clears throat> that I believe after Urban died, his successor, he, he was speculating it was possible that none of them are the Pope because it wasn't their recognition. No people, the, the universal church couldn't recognize who the true head was. But that was his opinion. There are others that say, no, the true Pope was here. And I believe that was the case. Urban VI was the true Pope. But according to Suarez, he said it's possible that none of them, because a doubtful Pope is no Pope. Now, there is a, a, an eminent canonist, moral theologian, Zapineda, Timothy Zapineda. He's a priest uh, who taught this past century. He's not, you know, many, many centuries ago. He was talking about this idea of all authority coming from God to the Pope and from the Pope to the bishops, the bishops to their pastors, etc. And after he explains this idea of jurisdiction, he, he presents uh, what, he, what you would consider objections. Okay, if what you're saying is true, what about this, what about this, what about this? So he, he presents these objections to his thesis and then he, he answers them. And one of the things he brings up is this great Western schism. How do we explain in this great Western schism, how do we explain that uh, jurisdiction was given to these others? And he said it's supplied. It was supplied from the true Pope to these others for the common good of these other people who were Catholic. They were mistakenly on the wrong side, but they were Catholic. And for their benefit, the church supplied jurisdiction. He goes to the extreme. He says, now, what if, hypothetically, none of them were the Pope? Then what? And, and Father Timothy Zapaneda says, then jurisdiction would come from Christ himself because the church has the mission from Christ to, to teach all nations, to sanctify, etc. And so, once again, this concept of supply jurisdiction, it's not something we're making up. It's something right in canon law. Uh, the canon in canon law is canon 209. There's also another canon about the faithful can for any just cause petition the sacraments. It's canon 2261. So, in this area of, of supplied jurisdiction, there are some that will not go to any traditional priest. Not the priest of Mount St. Michael's anybody say well you know none of you got jurisdiction and therefore you can't go to the sacraments to anybody nobody's good and just got to stay home <clears throat> well that's a sad sad position to take other thing I wanted to talk about uh, differences of opinion that's a good one <clears throat> To explain this, I'd like to share with you just an interesting thing about studying Latin. When you study your first year of Latin, everything's just so clear-cut. you got your declensions, you got your congregations, and everything's just black and white. The subject's first, the verb is last, and it's always like this. And then when you advance the second and third year and fourth year of Latin, you get into these great orators. And it seems like all those rules go to heck because of you know, uh, what they call, uh, you know, poetic license. You know, make it sound good, so we're going to move this over here and move this over there. And it's like, <laughs> I wish it was as simple and as black and white as it was in first year in Latin. Well, sometimes there are Catholic laity who think along the same lines that everybody has to always be on the same page and exactly the same thing on every single opinion that's out there. And when you study moral theology, you find out there are different opinions because the Catholic Church, the Pope has not made a definitive statement on this or that or whatever. I'll give you an example of this, and I'm saying this not to confuse you, but just kind of give you an example of how there are different opinions. Uh, with regard to restitution. <clears throat> Restitution, uh, the idea that you have to pay back something that you stole or if you damage somebody's property. Now, we're going to talk about restitution based on unjust damage. 
I like to, this is the example I show to the seminarians. So I say, okay, seminarians, this is the bishop's car. This is Father Gregory's car. Okay, the bishop gives a pretty low grade to a seminarian, and he's mad. So he's going to say, I'm going to do some major damage to the bishop's car. But it being dark, and he's tired, and it's the middle of the night, instead of hitting my car, he damages Father Gregory's car. Obviously, he's committed a sin, right? He's committed a sin against the seventh commandment. But in the area of restitution, there are two different opinions. There's one opinion that says, well, it doesn't matter that he made a mistake and damaged Father Gregory's car. He damaged somebody's car and he has to pay it back. So he has to pay Father Gregory back regardless of a mistake. On the other hand, there are some theologians who say, no, Father Gregory is a good friend of him. He gets good grades from Father Gregory. He likes Father Gregory. He would have never wanted to damage Father Gregory's car and therefore he wouldn't need to make restitution. Very interestingly, there are weighty theologians on both sides. Some saying yes, restitution. Some saying no restitution, etc. Church hasn't made any definitive statement on it. My personal opinion is if damage was done, you've got to pay for it. If it was a mistake that's completely accidental, but there are theologians who have their reasons saying no. He had no intention of damaging this car. It is totally accidental. He committed a sin. No one's going to deny that. But there's a need for restitution. There's some that say no. Now, I wanted to say this by way of giving you a couple other examples. One is with regard to uh, matrimonial impediments. Matrimony, impediments. There are two types of impediments. There are impediments that are called impedient, meaning it renders marriage unlawful. You need to get a dispensation from the impediment or it's unlawful, but still a valid marriage. And there's also impediments that are dirimant, meaning if you don't get a dispensation, there is no marriage. It's invalid, null, invalid, void. No marriage took place. And there's a particular impediment. It's Canon 1068. And it's talking about a dirimant impediment. If there is a certain operation that a person undergoes, it renders marriage invalid. Now, the question came up, and it's really a question of fact. The question, whole, the whole thing, the matter of fact is, is this under this canon. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail other than to say that if the impediment was antecedent to the marriage, it was there before they got married, and it's perpetual, it renders marriage invalid. But among theologians in Rome, the question of whether something was perpetual or not, whether this operation could be reversed or not, it was not known. And even in normal times, normal times, you have the Rhoda saying, no, it renders that particular situation, marriage is invalid, it's, it, it falls under this canon. But under this canon, there's a part two. Canon 1068, number two says, in doubt of fact, marriage is not to be prohibited. It lets people get married. And the Holy Office, following number two, saying there's a doubt of fact, the Holy Office said they should get married. Yes. And the reason why I want to mention this is not to go into detail about a, a difference of opinion, but even in normal times, you can have men on one side or men on the other side saying this or saying that, and you you know go don't have a you know a, a major conniption saying ah you know we should be on the same page. Yes, when it comes to absolute things that are of faith and morals that the church is infallibly taught, there's no question about that. But there are some categories, and in this case, 
because of the advancement of medical technology, this is not perpetual. And so the Holy Office didn't have an answer at that time. I mean, they couldn't say for sure, but they said, wait a minute, if there's a doubt of fact whether this is really perpetual or not, when the Pope, Pope Benedict XV in 1917, when they issued the Code of Canon Law, they considered the possibility of a doubt of fact. If you're not sure, then their marriage is to be allowed. And the Holy Office ended up being right because what was a doubt is now certain that it can be reversed. My point in saying this is just to make it kind of clear that you know, you have different priests out there to have different opinions on any given topic. Because the situation we find ourselves in, in the church is very unique. It's not, um, it's very extraordinary to say the least. And so when there are differences of opinion, let's not be too bent out of shape. The important thing to remember is, is that, uh, you know, as, is a common expression. And things that are certain in matters of faith, there has to be unity. And that in matters of doubt, where there's, there's, it's just a matter of opinion, there can be liberty. But in all things, we need to have charity. Do I agree with all the different traditional groups out there, their position? No. And I'm not talking about m m some of the you know, the bigger things that divide us. I'm talking about on any given thing. Certain matrimonial cases. Uh, certain practical pastoral practices. I mean, there's a wide range of, there's a wide variety of, of opinions out there. And we shouldn't be so rigid on this or that particular point that uh, I'm not going to talk to you anymore and people shouldn't go to your sacraments and stay away from you because you don't agree with me on everything. As one traditional priest said, those who follow that opinion, it's the follow me or die. And we got to remember that uh, we live in extraordinary times and there are different opinions. I'll give you an example. With regard to this issue of uh, ordinary means to preserve life and extraordinary means to preserve life. What is this comes under the fifth commandment? Thou shalt not kill. Under the fifth commandment, we are obliged to not only kill, but to take care of ourselves, take care of our health. But to what, ex what uh, length what extent do we need to take care of ourselves? We need to use the ex we need to use the ordinary means. We are obliged to use the ordinary means. We are it's not necessary. It's one may, but it's not necessary to use extraordinary means. What it comes under the category of extraordinary means? Something that would entail extreme pain or inconvenience, extreme expense. These are, these are areas that I think over the years have changed. You know, maybe a hundred years ago when they did not have the anesthetics that we have today, you undergo an operation without the anesthetics to cutting you open and taking things out. Extreme pain, extreme inconvenience. But what would have been extraordinary maybe a hundred years ago because of modern technology and medical advancements, this is not extraordinary anymore. But we should not confuse extraordinary with what we would say is common. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, there are some people who can't swallow. There are some people that can't take food by the mouth, so they have a tube in their stomach. And with the tube in their stomach, they can be fed through that tube in the stomach and they, they live an ordinary life. In fact, I heard that the number is about, at least in the United States, 100,000 people going around with a tube in their stomach and are fed that way. They're walking, talking, they go to school, they carry, a, they, they carry on a job. 
and there's about a 100,000 people that are being fed by a tube in their stomach. Is this common? No. Is it extraordinary? I don't think so. It doesn't entail, uh, entail extreme pain or inconvenience to get the injection. It's done. Extreme expense? No. And so there can be differences of opinion. I know one situation was the Terry Schiavo case. And, uh, you know, some people say, go ahead and disconnect her. Extraordinary means, let her go. I mean, we discussed this with our priest at great length. And I said, although a tube in the stomach is not common, the procedure is relatively simple, inexpensive. And if she gets, if Terry Shiva got that tube in her stomach, she'll be continuing to live what she's doing right now. Was she dying? No. When she was, she was there, albeit her quality of life, her quality of, level of quality of life was maybe not the best. There's a lot of side issues that I don't want to get into with Terry Shivel, but the point to be made is this. When it comes to extraordinary means and ordinary means, I think this is something that we, it's very important for us to weigh. You might have a loved one who is elderly, a mom or a dad or grandparents that are elderly. The idea of hydration and also nutrition, something that you have to keep in mind. You don't want to have them die of dehydration or starving them. Uh, if they're going to go, they're going to go. If, if nature's taking its course, that's one thing. But to expedite that by cutting off this. But then again, I would have to also say too that every situation is different. I mean, you can't just give a, a, a clear, this is the category and everybody fits into it because there's different situations. What if you have someone who has an obstruction in their bowels and they can't take in any more food? They're drinking, they're eating, and just it's not going anywhere. And they're in extreme pain to take any more, anything more. They can't be operated on. They're, they're, let's say they have cancer or something like that. They can't be operated on. For them, it's to no purpose. In fact, it is excruciating to do anything, and it's not going anywhere. So, you know, I'm not a doctor. Not a medical professional, and I, when, when, in any given situation, we try to do our best to know what the principles are, and to make sure that we're being reasonable. So, in the case of like somebody who has cancer and just can no longer swallow, can't take anything, forcing them, forcing them to to do something that can't be done. I mean, it, it's going to cause extreme pain, or prolonging the inevitable. What's going to absolutely inevitably happen? It's not a matter of getting them over a hump and they're going to get better, but they're dying. Then we have to be reasonable. But the point is, is that are there different opinions on this? Yes, there are. Do I condemn those who don't agree with me? No. They can have their opinion, but it, you know, I don't agree with this or I don't agree with that, and it's not the end of the world. But we need to remember that there are different opinions. There are, when you get, really, when you look at a lot of the different moral theology books, for the most part, they're all on the same page because they know what the Catholic Church teaches. They know what the popes have set down. But then there's areas where you have some theologians who are very, very strict. And there are other theologians who are, I would say, more moderate. And there's these differences of opinion. And it's not the end of the world when you, when you see these different opinions. But it's up for the priest himself when he, when he has an opinion, he abides by that opinion, he's going to give his advice based on solid you know, answers from theologians, etc. So I hope that kind of explains something there. Another thing I wanted to briefly cover is that of the modern rite for the consecration of bishops. In 1969, right around the same time that the Novus Ordo was about to come out, 
they knew there was a new right of consecration of bishops. We are very limited on our time, but I'd like to just get right to the point. What were the issues that we should be aware of? Number one, Pope Leo XIII, in his Apostolic Constitution, Apostolice Curie, he declared Anglican orders invalid meaning the Protestants from the Church of England had no true priests, no true bishops. And this was based on the fact that after Henry VIII brought the Church of England into schism because he couldn't get a divorce, so he broke with Rome, broke with the Pope, broke with the Catholic Church, said he is the head of the Church. After him came his son Edward. Now Edward was just a boy. And so the Protestants had a heyday and, and, and when changing the Mass and, and the, the sacramental form, they came out with a common book of prayer, etc. It was the Edwardian ordinal. And from then on, this new rite for ordaining priests and consecrating bishops was used. Now, mind you, when Henry VIII broke with the church, there were some priests and bishops who were put to death. They did not compromise with Henry VIII. Cardinal Fisher, uh, and also, the, you know, uh, St. Thomas More, he was, a, he was the uh, Chancellor of England at one time. He was a layman. He was put to death. But there were many bishops and priests who were put to death under Henry VIII. Nevertheless, those bishops who went along with Henry VIII, they still were validly ordained and validly consecrated. They had the power of bishops and they could, they could, if they used the proper right, consecrate other bishops, other, other men bishops. But that was not the case. Even though the bishops who broke with the church and went along with Henry VIII for whatever reasons, when Edward VI came to reign, the problem is that they were using this new right and all of them came from this man by the name of Matthew Parker. He was the first one to be supposedly consecrated as a bishop with this new rite. And from Matthew Parker, all the other Anglican bishops came from. So it was a relatively easy thing to go back. Pope Leo XIII thoroughly investigated the whole issue of this new rite that the Protestants, English Protestants were using and in his Apostolic Constitution, Apostolic Curie, he said they do not have valid orders. They so altered the form that it changed the meaning. It became very ambiguous what was being done. The form that they gave was receive the Holy, Holy Spirit, something without explaining what's being given, the power, the graces, the office. This, this, the, all those things just went out the window. It was replaced with an ambiguous receive the Holy Spirit, etc., etc. But those things that were essential that the form ought to express were not expressed. What's interesting is in 1968, there was a new form for the consecration of bishops. The old form made it very clear. Complete in thy priest, the fullness of the priesthood, the fullness of thy ministry. If you look at not only the Latin rite of the Catholic Church, but even the Eastern rites, the idea of the power of the bishop was being given. Complete in thy priest, the fullness of thy ministry, which is the episcopacy. It was very clear. But then this modern rite it says this, So now pour forth upon this chosen one that power which is from you, the governing spirit, whom you gave to your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, the spirit given to him by to the apostles who founded the church in every place to be your temple for increasing the glory and praise of your name. Pour forth upon this chosen one that power which is from you, this governing spirit, the rest of it explains the governing spirit, but it doesn't say what power is being given. Whereas in the 
traditional rite, complete, fill up in thy priest the fullness of thy ministry, sanctify him. It goes on and on and on, but it makes it very clear. But in this area, what makes it even clearer besides Apostolic Curie is Pope Pius XII in the 1940s in Sacramentum Ordinis. A question had come up, what is exactly the matter and the form for the Sacrament of Holy Orders? And Pope Pius XII made it very clear. The matter is the imposition of hands and the form are the following words. And he gave it for the diaconate, the priesthood, and the episcopacy. Very clearly defined. When you look at this 1968 version and you look at and compare it with the Edwardian rite, receive the Holy Ghost. Now pour forth upon this Chosen one, the power that is from you, the governing spirit. What that power is, doesn't say. What the graces are, doesn't say. What office, doesn't say. Using the principles of what Pope Leo XIII said and the clearly defined formula, the form that Pope Pius XII determined, there is no doubt that this New 68 right is right in line with the Edwardian right. Ambiguous and therefore we should not believe it to be valid. The problem that comes in is, is that you have bishops, now it was 1968, that's basically 40 years ago. You have bishops consecrated with this new right that's form, which form is ambiguous, does not express what needs to be expressed to convey you know, the form of the sacrament. For 40 years, you, have, you can have men who, let's say, were consecrated in their 40s, their, in their 70s and 80s. The problem comes in, they can look like they're old men. If they were validly ordained, that's one thing. But this new rite is no better than the Anglican rite. And that's the reason why the problem comes in now is that you have these modern bishops ordained what's called the 1968 bishops quote unquote bishops who are using the traditional rite in order to ordain, supposedly ordain men to the priesthood that's a problem that's a big problem because if they have not been validly consecrated bishops, then these men are not ordained to priesthood, even though the traditional rite is being used. And it just makes it an absolutely very confusing mess. Not only in 1969 did they come out with the Novus Ordo, but you know, they, in the spirit of renewal and, and reform and whatever, this is a major problem here, a major problem. And you know, we're not going into detail. I'd be happy to, but it, it would take too long. But just do the comparison yourself. I remember hearing of a, a fellow who was studying this for the first time. And when he said, when I looked at what Pope Pius XII had set down as the form for the consecration of bishops in Sacramento Mordinis, and I looked at the new rite in 1968, he said it's, 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 it's extremely obvious. There's a problem here. This thing is completely lacking. It's ambiguous. It doesn't say anything. It's just as much as receive the Holy Spirit. This one says receive the power from the Spirit. What that power is, it doesn't say. And that brings up another question too. And We were talking about in our first talk about uh, that one fellow from Australia, the journalist. But you hear of what I would say, traditional groups that are biting the dust. Not too long ago, there was the Society of St. John Vienni down in Campos, who at one time followed Bishop Castromayer. He was a very staunch traditionalist. Well, they then got, quote-unquote, permission from Rome, uh, got reconciled. But what's the condition of reconciliation? You have to accept the Novus Ordo, and you have to accept Vatican II. 
Those are the two points. In fact, very interesting, when Father Kasmer and I went to Germany at the end of August, we came back early September. We landed in Chicago O'Hare Airport. We go to get our bags to go through customs. and We went through customs. We had to go through immigration, go to customs, whatever, get our bags. And who are standing there with all these seminarians and their cassocks? They were redemptorists. I know them. I, guess I, I know redemptorists because I know they have a distinct cassock. And I told them right off, I, when I saw them, I said, oh, you're, you're a redemptorist from Scotland. And you know, for these young fellows who first time get to the United States, like, you know us. And uh, I said, I know your superior, Father Sims. A little story behind Father Sims, and that is, Father Sims was a Novus Ordo Redemptorist priest in Wellington, New Zealand. They used to have a monastery there. And uh, he had heard that these traditionalists were visiting New Zealand. I was a seminarian at the time. And he really very much wanted to meet us. He knew that there's something wrong in the modern church. And so I can't describe Wellington exactly, but it's, uh, it's right on the uh, southern part of New Zealand, uh, the North Island. And you got the uh, Captain Cook Strait, and then you go to the South Island. So a beautiful area. is like a bay there. And their monastery overlooked the bay. Beautiful monastery. And uh, he, he went from the monastery all the way downtown to the cathedral. And he said to Our Lady, I'll pray the rosary. And as I pray the rosary, I hope I'll meet these traditionalists. I was trying to find the Abel Tasman Hotel. And like I said, I have some timer's disease. I can't tell you what I did yesterday or a week ago, but uh, there's certain things that you don't forget. And I remember I was trying to find the Abel Tasman Hotel, and I was right in front of the cathedral thinking, man, where do I go? You know, it's completely confused and all of a sudden he comes up to me and says oh you're one of those traditionalists and you know you're just all excited well he eventually got conditionally ordained and then he was associated with the Society of St. Pius X he, they, they live on an island they're building this this monastery on this island off of Scotland and he sends me his periodicals and what he's doing I, I talked to him once when he was touring the United States he called me and I hadn't spoken to him for about 20 years but unfortunately, these redemptorists now have gotten reconciled. And that means that these redemptorists, why were they in the States? They were going to Lincoln, Nebraska to go to the conservative Vatican II seminary there, which is not all that conservative. I mean, they, yeah, there were the Catholics, etc. But over and above that, there's a lot of things that are very Vatican II and modern in that diocese. They still have the polka masses and all that other, you know, uh, typical Vatican II stuff. So when, when, when they asked, well, who are you? I said, my name is Bishop Hero. And I said, oh, Mater Dei Seminary. You're from Nebraska, too. I mean, they knew, they knew who I was. And I said, you know, it's really disappointing what you've done. You, you're going to now accept the Novus Ordo. You're now going to accept Vatican II. I mean, what is different today in the year 2008 than back in 1980s when your superior, Father Sims, first got conditionally ordained and left the modernism of the Vatican II Church behind? What's the difference? Has things changed? No, they haven't changed. If anything, they've gotten worse. I said, you've now been silenced. You're not going to be able to contradict and say, hey, that's not right, that's an abuse, this isn't Catholic. You're not going to be able to say any of that stuff. You're going to keep your mouth shut, and for that you're, you'll be considered, you consider, you'll consider yourself, oh, I'm going to Latin Mass, I'm a traditional, but you're not. Because now you've, you've come into this realm. And what's going to happen when they come into this realm here? The time may come when you've been in long enough into the system, oh, we need a priest to go to this parish. And this parish does not have the Latin Mass. The people, they don't know the Latin Mass. So we need you to offer the new Mass. Now they may say, no, no. They, they said, we don't have to, we're not going to have to do that. But down in Campos, Brazil, the Bishop Rifan, I believe that's his name, I saw a picture of him 
who compromised and agreed that he get reconciled, etc. He was attending a Novus Ordo Mass. And like we've mentioned before, Novus Ordos can have this inculturization. Well, at this Novus Ordo, they had a reenactment of Adam and Eve. And it wasn't the best of scenarios. I'm not going to go any more detail, but it was embarrassing. When I saw the picture, I said, man, I can't look at this. Because they had a picture of him sitting there amongst the bishops and these people, man and woman, depicting Adam and Eve right in front of him. I was like, man. And he calls himself a traditional bishop. So it's a matter of, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll give you all you want as long as you accept the Novus Ordo and the, and the Vatican too. And we don't want to hear any problems, you know. Keep it to yourself. Maybe some of these people think, well, we're going to work from within. They got you where they want you. And the point to be made is, is that the situation becomes very complex because you have men that were a cassock that say their father is so-and-so that aren't ordained to the priesthood because they were supposedly ordained by bishops who aren't even bishops because that problem is the 1968 right, the form of consecration of bishops has been changed. And so when we speak of these things, I um, just want to let you know that uh, there's reasons why going to a local modern church for what you think might be a Latin Mass there's multiple problems there. Supposedly, you know, let's suppose that the priest is old enough where he is a valid priest. He offers a Latin Mass, it's a valid Mass. But, when he goes into the tabernacle, are you going to receive the host that were consecrated at a true Mass? Are you going to receive the host from an invalid Mass at a Novus Ordo? But the point is, too, is, is that we should stay away from that altogether. Because even if the priest is a validly ordained priest, offering it in a Novus Ordo atmosphere in a parish, what you're going to have is you're going to hear Novus Ordo doctrines, Novus Ordo teachings. You're going to hear about this and that, that uh, obviously those priests wouldn't be where they're at unless they accepted a Novus Ordo, they accepted Vatican II. And that's a compromise of our faith. So I, I think what I'm trying to get at is, is that you have to be, especially in this day and age, informed what the principles are and we have to be careful. And, you know, God gave us an intellect and we have to use our intellect and be very, very careful about where we are at and what we're doing. We have a soul to save and there's been enough deception as there, uh, as, uh, as it is and we don't need to be further involved and drug into situations that are no good. There is a book, uh, it's called the, uh, uh, I think it's from Traditio. It has, you know, all the Latin masses throughout the United States. It'd be very well for you to be very careful about who you're going to. How many of those priests are not Catholic priests, but were ordained old Catholic, schismatic? Or how many of them are not even validly ordained priests? And how many of them, you don't really know their background. So you have to be very cautious. So they don't you, you don't put yourself in a bad situation. Oh, there was a number of other things I wanted to cover. I think we're a little bit over time, um, but I think we're supposed to have a question and answer period. And at this stage, what I'd like to do is just have a little break, and then maybe some of these points we could be mentioned at question and answer period. Father.